This is Navigating Cyber Risk Podcast with me, John Riley, and George Ucy as your hosts. Join us as we explore the challenges faced by executives as they grapple with new and ever-changing cybersecurity mandates. Hey, welcome to Navigating Cyber Risk with your hosts, George UC, that'd be me, and John Riley. Hello. That's the other guy, the bearded guy over there. And uh, we're going to explore the challenges faced by executives as they kind of grapple with new cybersecurity mandates, um, otherwise known as cyber risk, as you can by the title of the podcast. I'm assuming that you probably have an idea that some of our topics are going to be related to that. So welcome. And uh, today we have a guest. His name is Ryan Grimes, and he is from the Indianapolis area. Uh, Ryan is uh, got a wonderful organization that is, uh, I think, just if you're watching our podcast today, you'll see it's My IT Indie. Uh, he's got his uh, logo up there uh, for everyone to recognize. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, cyber risk today as we do in our uh, normal series. We have a little bit of a shift, though. Previously, we were um, we kind of retitled our podcast, so we're excited for anyone that is joining this one. We had some issues with our other title not coming up in search. So hopefully this one will give us a little bit more traction. We're excited to have you here. And uh, we're going to get straight into our questions. So first and foremost, um, we have a uh, uh, we have a kind of opening question here that addresses cyber risk. And so I want you to explain the difference to me, or how would you explain the difference between cybersecurity and cyber risk. Okay. Um, well, thank you both, both for having me on the show today. Um, so, risk is the the chance of something going badly. Uh, that's why I would, that's how we talk to our uh, clients and prospects about it. So, cyber risk is really you know when you're doing a thing on your computer, um, whether it's you know opening an email, clicking on a link, uh, you know, opening a document, or any of those things. Like, there's a there it is hopefully small. Uh, risk that something will go bad. Um, as you uh, become more complicated and as the world becomes more global and as we are more dependent upon technology, uh, that risk goes up significantly because there's actually bad people trying very hard to uh, compromise you and your company. And it could be through the new intern uh, that gets sent the email from the boss saying to go buy gift cards. It can be uh, someone in HR getting emailed like, hey, I need to change my payroll bank account. Um, and so what cybersecurity does is it tries to, first off, block those things from happening to begin with, um, but also to educate people on how to recognize when things might be a little bit sketchy or, or, or something bad could be happening before they fully engage with the subject matter. It's kind of like driving a car, right? You know, cars are safer now than they were five years ago, but you still have to pay attention and know what's going on around you at the same time because the car is not going to save you from driving straight into a brick wall. Yeah, the old fashioned uh, information superhighway reference for those of us that are growing <laughs> gray hair might know that's what we used to call the internet, the information superhighway. So the, mm -hmm. the car analogy makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think, uh, you know, every business is on a journey on a road. Um, and uh, m for the most part, their employees are the ones that are driving. So, uh, and so a great reflection of, you know, some of these things that could happen because who knows who might crash into your business while mm -hmm. it's online. It might not even be a hacker. It may actually be a customer with a contract as well. But, you know, for the most part, it's hackers that we worry about and those cyber risks are, 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 are plenty. So, but getting into the hacker side of things, um, what do you think is the most significant cybersecurity threat that are facing companies today? Uh, in our opinion, from what we've seen with prospects that have come to us and clients that we've you know helped navigate these things, um, the, the biggest risk is the human being not paying attention. Um, because you're in a hurry, you do, you're like, oh, uh, John just sent me an email. Great, he needs his information. Click, I got to run, I got to get out the door. And you're not engaging with, the technology, you take your eyes off the road and a kid runs in front of the car or something, or, or, or a deer runs in front of the car. Let's do something a little bit less morbid. Um, and that's that's where the bad things happen. And we've actually had prospects come to us 
they say, you know, we have all these security measures in place and somebody wasn't paying attention to what they were doing and they were in a rush and I don't want to paint a bad picture, but the person was not very young either. So they weren't, they didn't grow up in this world, this digital world. They were uh, of the age that they're vastly from before the digital world coming in. So um, they didn't grow up with technology. They didn't kind of understand a lot of these things. And he just wasn't paying attention. And he said, oh, I just need to re-enter my password. And walked out the door on a Friday afternoon thinking he had taken care of something great. And only bad things happened after that. Yeah, I think a lot of times it's it's distraction. I mean, you know, pe people are people and then there's life distractions that happen. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it could be a fight with the the, the kid or the, the the significant other or whatever piece it is, but their mind is distracted. And as you said, I mean, it, it, it just takes that one moment of taking your eyes off the uh, off the road to 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 watch for deer, you know, and, and if mm -hmm. you're not watching, then something can happen. And, and it happens in the blink of an eye. So. Yep. That, that, and you don't know what's happened. It's not like someone came in and stole the TV off your wall, right? It's like, oh, wait, where's my TV? Like all the, that stuff can be gone and you'd never even notice. And that's the huge thing that these, you know, a lot of executives don't understand is it's not like someone stealing your car or you just walk out and your car is gone. Like, no, they've gotten your bank information. They've gotten all your, you know, your, your PII, your P, uh, any medical stuff that you have going on. And it's just gone and somebody else is going to do something bad with it. But it doesn't look like anything's gone. Matt, for our listeners, especially if you're an executive, uh, PII is personally identifiable yeah. information. So in these days, there are some states that it, that is classified as a personal email address and a full name. And that's it. And all of a sudden, you've got you know, laws that mm -hmm. are cascading down on your business. And so that's why a lot of your contracts are probably in that position. So um, nevertheless. Um, that's a CEO problem. That's interestingly enough, because mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the most frustrating things in the technical industry is if you're a supporting technology is that you don't necessarily code the software, right? But you, you're, you're acquiring it and, you know, you don't get to see how that's working if something is, is broken. And so these emergencies and distractions, John was talking about, I think that's a, that's one of the challenges in the origins, right? You know, is that uh, there might be a perception that technology people can just jump right in and look at the code and fix a problem. Um, most of the time they cannot. They have to you know, depend on the maker of that software. Mm -hmm. So that causes distractions. That's one of the, probably the things that stands out for me the most is the origin of the distractions. Um, and even some famous scientists have indicated that, yeah, we've got some bad programming out there in software. Uh, and it's kind of the, the, the origin of the headache of a lot of IT, just IT work in general, in, in, in my experience. But uh, still, it's an executive's issue now. There's all these cascading cyber laws now. So that impact the CEO. So how do you think a CEO should prioritize cyber risk, knowing that they are now being chased by regulators and lawmakers and those sorts of things? Well, the first thing I do if I was a CEO of a company is I would go to my vendors that were buying products from them and show me their cyber risk uh, insurance coverage and show me what, you know, and go through the contracts we have signed with them because ultimately if they get breached and my customer data is out there in some way, shape or form, what, am, what can I do? Like, what are, what's the recourse for their sloppiness? Um, and you'd be, you know, as a B2B IT company and an IT services company, we have people that, you know, we, obviously we don't work with everybody. Not everyone's a great fit, but some people flat out say like, we just don't even believe in cybersecurity. Like we're not going to do anything to change what we're doing. And then my first response is, well, what do you, what would your customers think if they knew that? So if you're a CEO vetting products, like you really need to talk to their CISOs and their CTOs and get. Uh, documentation on what their security uh, procedures are for when they are breached and have you know an incident. So that's a great moment, right? That was a, that was exceptional when you said, uh, at least it stood out for me. When you have that mindset from an executive, of you know it's just that, that important to me, and the response of saying, "What would your customers?" say if they heard that what would they think that's phenomenal right i think that's i don't know that people consider that and um perhaps that's something that folks in technology can can um can learn from in terms of how to talk to executives and leaders because that's always a challenge especially 
when it comes to the cybersecurity laws that are now kind of looming and cascading down to all businesses. So, but I think what I've learned is that there's got to be a bean counter, somebody, you know, with somebody with an abacus. And what is that role, John? Who's that financial person in every company? The CFO. Yes. Generally. <laughs> You know, they have a really tough job, you know, they're just as analytical as your typical IT, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, as your typical IT worker or leader. So, um, in, in, in experience, right? So they're going to think very analytically, but, you know, anything with a blinking light may not be their, their sweet spot. So, um, so how do you think the CFO should handle cybersecurity and cyber risk related budgeting? Ooh. Grapple with budgeting. <laughs> Oh, that's always a fun discussion because, you know, we, we can cite facts and figures and studies and recommendations. And at the end of the day, it can all be thwarted with a now we're good. Um, so what we do is uh, I don't have access to it right now, but there is a Gartner study out there that basically says that mature companies should spend between five and eight percent of their annual revenue on technology. So what does that look like for a company? I mean, that includes, you know, SaaS products, hardware, network infrastructure, everything that they need to do the technology in the in their company. So we start with that number and we, you know, we talk to them about their revenue because that's our risk is dependent upon uh, how badly they do things. And we need to mitigate the risk, minimize the risk and all those things. But the risk profile of a $5 million company is vastly different than a $20 million company. And their fee structure should accommodate that. And their, the technology stack we use to protect them should accommodate that. So what we do is we say, basically we break it down for them and, and things that they can understand. Like I said, if you were down for a week, here's what your cost would be based on average payroll for uh, an employee in the United States of America, multiplied by the amount of employees, uh, the fact that they can't take in orders, they can't uh, process orders, they can't deliver orders, and their reputation uh, after the fact. And we basically, you know, we run the numbers with them in the room and they come up with whatever the number is. It could be, you know, $50,000, $100,000, you know, of, of just lost revenue. I said, okay, great. Let's start with that in terms of what you should be paying and then go have it continue the conversation from there because those are the real things that happen. Like it's still in 2023, you get companies that don't understand that they have to do these things. And there's like, now we'll be good, but they won't be. Eventually something bad will happen. So if they don't want it to happen to them, to them, then we need to have serious conversations. And most CFOs get it by the time they're like, okay, here's what a week of downtime looks like. Is, is this okay for you to have? And they're like, well, no, I, you know, that's a month's worth of uh, you know, payroll and all that stuff. Like, okay, well, let's take care of that. Um, and the ones that, that understand the business and understand their numbers get it. And the ones that are like, yeah, no, we'll just take our chances. It's like, I'll go, we'll just close if that happens. <laughs> no big deal. Yeah, and you know, some people do have that mindset. Um, it mm -hmm. depends on the business and what you're doing, I imagine. But um, but every business is that's growing is uh, is a successful business. Not not my words, but you know, you hear it over and over again, and you know, from business leaders throughout the years. Mm -hmm. If you're not growing, you're dying, um, and that has a lot to do with emerging trends that help a business go faster or somehow improve things to be more competitive. So, what emerging trends do you believe? that are in the area of tech that will have a profound impact on cybersecurity in the near future? One of the things we're seeing now is the globalization of even small businesses. So for instance, you can have employees in, you know, your company can be based in the United States, but you have employees in the Philippines, you have employees in Asia, uh, you have employees in South America, you have employees in Europe. And how do you control what they can and cannot do when it's not just that they're not in the office and they're working from home, but they're working, you know, six time zones away from your, your main office. And how do you control the experiences with that? And that's really been um, driving a uh, hard in small business uh, the last year or two, just because it's honestly hard to find good talent here in the United States for everything we need to do. Like, it's just impossible. Like we have outside resources we pull in because it just we need we need human beings to work off hours you know we just we we need that level of resources for our clients so our we we recognize that and we control that 
Um, and that's what businesses really need to do is understand that the globalization of the small business is legit and it will absolutely impact how they have to secure uh, their technology. I can imagine that as the businesses evolve, that especially small businesses and become global, that uh, that may inevitably mean more cyber disasters. So if you had to think about kind of in the context of an exercise we call a pre-mortem, um, a lot of peer groups uh, or CEO peer groups, and CEOs talk about doing something like this. So if you have a cyber disaster journey, so you're having a cyber disaster and you're on that journey, the hackers succeeded and they've stolen sensitive data. Um, what does that journey look like in the, in, the, in the CEO's head? What are some of the things, uh, or even the executive team, right? What, what do you think that journey might be? Like if you had to take it from, uh-oh, they're in and we think they've taken things. Well, we've actually been on that journey with uh, a, a, an ex-client who re-became a client um, because they, uh, it was a small law firm. Uh, they decided that they're very intelligent individuals. Uh, they went to law school. Um, they can do their own IT after, you know, after we were quoting them some services and like, no, nah, we got this, we're good. Um, and then they had an incident and it was devastating to them because not only did it happen, but it didn't, they didn't even know it happened for almost a month afterwards uh, because no, the, the, they were very patient. So it's not like someone's going to smash into your front door, grab your TV, run out the door, and things happen immediately after the incident. Uh, what happens is that they're patient. They're waiting for data. They're collecting your inbox. They're, they're sitting there waiting for clues as to how to maximize what's going, what, what they can take from you. And it was a simple thing where internal communication was uh, one lawyer sending him an invoice saying, hey, can you have so-and-so pay this? She's pre-authorized up to uh, $50,000 via ACH. And then they waited a couple of days, replicated the email, changed the billing information on the same invoice and sent it over and said, oh, hey, we got another one. Uh, we need to pay this one as well. And they paid it. And there was no, nobody knew until a month later when their accountant's going, what's this invoice for? Like, I've, I've never seen a $49,000 invoice twice in a row. Um, and they're like, wait a minute, what happened? And then all of a sudden, everyone like had their, oh, you know what moment. And then they started backtracing as to what happened. And they finally figured out that uh, one of the uh, lead attorneys got the email saying, hey, uh, it's time to change your password. If you want to keep your same password, click here. And that's all it took. There was no multi-factor authentication. There was no verbal confirmation in-house. So like, hey, George, you sent me this invoice for $49,000. Is this real? Like just a phone call, right? That would have saved them $50,000. So CEOs, what they should be doing is first off planning something bad's going to happen. Like there's just no way to get around it. Something dumb's going to happen. Someone's going to do something stupid. The, you just have to minimize the possibility for it to happen. Have simple things like internal checks to verify amounts for invoices over a thousand dollars, or make sure that you're actually consulting with security experts on how to, you know, keep up to date on these things um, and outsource it if you have to. Like I understand that we work with some companies, and we're not the you know level one or level two IT guys. We're the people that are making sure those people aren't making mistakes, and we're making sure we're overseeing their. Uh, cloud infrastructure to making sure that things are being, you know, being uh, respectfully treated and not just, oh, look, we're sharing this entire box file, box.com drive out or this Google Drive or this Microsoft SharePoint folder. You know, have, other, have separate eyes on it that are experts in their fields and that'll help, you know, stop it from happening in the first place. Do you think that the many CEOs, uh, one of the reasons maybe for cloud adoption and then the, and the slower cloud adoption, right? I mean, over the years is because they like to see that data, not just not just the data, but the spinning drives to know that's where my data is. I, I, th I always thought that that was kind of the, the the slow roll of, you know, being able to get off exchange servers and, you know, being able to have the, have those uh, those SaaS providers be able to take over some of those things. Mm -hmm. Is that still an issue that you're seeing out there with the CEO, especially the older CEOs saying, I want I want to see it. I want to touch it. I want to I want to know that the data is there, even though the entire data could be stolen from underneath them and they would never know. 
We had, we've had uh, CEOs and presidents tell us um, if it's not out there in the cloud, it can't get hacked. And that's why they have it in house. I'm like, well, no, but okay. Like there are certain protections in place when you have things on premise, like we all, you know, you unplugging the server and running out the front door with it is probably not going to happen. And if you're not sharing anything outside, but then again, how, how technologically efficient is your company, right? Like, how are you sharing things back and forth between your vendors and your clients? They're like, oh, we're just attaching, you know, 120 meg files to, to, uh, on emails and letting it rip. Like, wait, what? Like, that doesn't make any sense. There's, you know, there's a fine line. And yes, it is with a lot of older presidents and CEOs that we've seen that are like, you know, um, they're very technical. We've always done it this way. Like, if, if you're sitting here at your desk, using your computer and your phone works here and your computer only works here. And once you leave, you can't access anything. That's certainly one way to do it. Yeah. It's the old uh, cash under the mattress yep. philosophy. Um, you yep. know, and but then how do you hire young talent, right? It is a difficult challenge for, um, you know, we're talking about late adopters and, you know, kind of traditional brick and mortar businesses that, um, you know, m most executives are, uh, I remember once upon a time, there was an executive who, you know, we were talking to them about their data and they should back it up and move it out and that sort of thing. This is years ago. And, uh, you know, the, the new CEO who was, uh, you know, just picked up his pencil and he's like, here's my backup and disaster recovery plan. We'll just write it down. So we used to do it. Uh -huh. uh, and, uh, you know, it was probably feasible for them at the time in that particular industry. They'll remain uh, unnamed. Because there are considerations, and I mean, obviously, there are some businesses that are using compute, you know, to some degree administratively, and they don't realize their how really serious their issue is until they realize that the thousands of employees they may employ, even though none of them may be touching tech, which is unlikely these days, mm -hmm. uh, that that's still data, that's still sensitive data, especially HR, workers comp, and, you know, all that information that's collected when somebody gets injured is, uh, you know, that's personal information. Mm -hmm. And so the, the challenge with the on-premise, as we would say in the tech industry, is uh, it's not as common in, in what I've seen, but it definitely still happens. So, well, you know, Ryan, we've learned a ton of from you in some of the questions that we've asked, but now we would like to learn a little bit about you. So can you tell us about your journey, who you are, mm -hmm. and how did you get here? And also tell us a little bit about your company. Sure. So it, as like most business owners, it's been a wild and uh, crazy ride uh, to hear. We've been in business, um, actually we started in 2004, when I got the idea, I actually was working at Apple in one of their retail stores back then. And I was like, this is fun. This is great. We're doing cool things. And then Apple came out with the iPod mini, which was like the little colored versions. And then overnight, everything went haywire. And they all, they, I mean, we sold every single one we could find. And I said, wow, this is not fun um, because it's boring and we're just selling you know, widgets and widgets are great. Um, my, my 401k loves Apple, um, but uh, working there was a challenge and retail was a challenge. So I decided, hey, let's move to a different state and start a company. And back in 2004, you know, they're like, you don't, you know, you and your spouse want to want a mortgage. Do either of you have a job? And we're like, no, um, like, sure, here's a couple hundred thousand dollars for a house. So we moved uh, to Indiana from the Chicago area and started our company. Um, I've got uh, three kids, two cats and two dogs and a, and a wonderful spouse who puts up with me on a daily basis, um, who understands small business ownership and is like, okay, you're going to miss dinner tonight because you got to go do something. Okay, fair enough. But we also have the ability, we prioritize family and take vacations together. Uh, we actually go do stuff because um, I don't, you know, burnout is real. Um, our industry is brutal and owning a business in this industry is uh, exponentially harder than everything else in the known universe <laughs> um, because we've all had those phone calls a Friday night from someone's like, yeah, I, I can't find anything. Like I'm locked out of my email and someone's asking for Bitcoin uh, and it just, your, your weekend just goes down from there. Um, luckily, 
Uh, we are, our business is all contract based. So we protect everybody and everything that's not negotiable. So knock on wood, uh, those incidents are few and far between. Um, mainly we just deal with people forgetting to tell us that somebody quit. Um, and then they still have access to the email like a month later and they're still paying us for it. Uh, so, you know, uh, um, in my uh, spare time, I'm probably uh, gardening uh, because that's my non-technology hobby. I'm an avid uh, pepper aficionado. So I grow like 50 some pepper plants um, ranging from the cute little snacking peppers that are all different colors to, oh my God, this makes the air burn just by being in the room. Uh, please make it stop uh, sort of pepper. So I actually make our own seasonings. We made our own hot sauce. We made our own salsas. Um, and that's what I do when I'm not doing this. Uh, our fall is very busy because that's kind of when everything comes into play and uh, the, we can harvest and grow stuff, uh, harvest and produce stuff. So yes, my house appears, uh, we have the windows open and it sometimes smells like tear gas in there. <laughs> so I actually had a friend who uh, was growing peppers and he, the, the dual pane windows reflect the sun, right? Mm -hmm. And his peppers were, you know, somewhere near that. And so when, what would happen is the sun would hit them and reflect back down to the peppers. So he ended up with these small black peppers, you know, small black peppers that were just uh, fired. They had, they had taken in this, uh, so much sun that it was like eating the sun. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> So there's something for you if you ever need that extra heat on those. Uh, hey, yeah. Put it, put them within win window range, <laughs> <laughs> reflection range. Yeah, I was gonna say that uh, you know, I imagine. Uh, so I have this vision of what your garden looks like, and and there's probably right. You probably got some onions growing, some cilantro growing, right? And it's just gonna be a pico de gallo fest, you know. <laughs> well, that's the oh, great thing. My neighbor grows all that stuff. I only grow peppers. I, <laughs> I just, I, yeah, I, I'm great at the peppers. Like I know how to make them grow great. He's great at like the tomatoes, uh, the onions, tomatoes, uh, the cilantro and all that stuff. And we just trade back and forth. I'm like, Hey, I'm going to go grab some tomatoes. He's like, go nuts. He's like, Hey, you have any jalapenos? Yep. Here you go. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, I'll see you in a couple months. Block, block, <laughs> exactly. block salsa party, huh? <laughs> this stuff I will, will uh, the great thing about salsa is you don't really know how hot it's going to be until after it cools down. So you've already made it and you're stuck with it. You're just like, oh, please, God, don't melt my face. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine with some of the, you know, I imagine there's probably some really, really um, hot uh, items growing in your backyard. I, mm -hmm. I, you probably have to deal with the pets um uh you know when you're harvesting and i imagine that's a bit of a challenge so um i've actually just started growing my own jalapenos this year so nice that's how it starts I'm at the beginning i'm at the beginning so we'll see how mm -hmm. it goes right. well we do like to um we do like to kind of end our podcast um on some kind of an action item right something that mm -hmm. uh, especially a leader an executive what's the one piece of advice or tip that you might give them to reduce cyber risk, whether it be regulatory related or in the trenches of cybersecurity warfare related, what would you recommend? The first thing I'd recommend is even if you have in-house IT, go consult an expert on this. Chances are people like, even people like us, we don't want to take the jobs away from your IT guys. Like that's not our goal. Our goal is to educate. So if, if you have questions about if something needs to get done or not, and your guys are saying, no, 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 we got this covered, always get a second opinion because you know what? We're human beings and human beings suck. So sometimes we're wrong about things. Get a second opinion or a third opinion and then sit down with your team and say, okay, here's what we're finding. Um, here's what we have to adhere to. Uh, are, are we doing this? Yes or no. And then if they're not, then figure out a path forward. Um, and honestly, there's a lot of bad IT people out there, in-house, outsourced, like get a second or third opinion on things and really make sure that you are doing the appropriate uh, compliance related restrictions and monitoring and security for your technology, for your industry and your business. That's some great advice. And uh, I think that you know, for the listeners, we do tend to uh, talk a, a little bit technical from time to time in these podcasts. So listen to what Ryan is saying. I don't think it was too technical what he said. Just get a second opinion. Uh, we did cover a couple technical items. Um, we talked about PII, personally identifiable information. 
And the other one is Ryan did mention earlier uh, something called MFA or multi-factor authentication. So uh, we understand that to most of you, like, yeah, what does that mean? So, so for those of you that are just kind of new as a, a leader, that is kind of like when you, if you bank online, which I think most people do these days, um, we're going to assume that you might. And so you log into your banking, your bank, and then they send you a text message that you have to enter in like a code. That's what multi-factor authentication is to those of you that weren't, weren't sure when that was said. And we want to see more of that happening. You should be doing that within your business, right? Because that just adds that additional layer to make it more difficult for people to take over your business and essentially either bring it down or abscond with all of your sensitive data. And with these new regulations out there, you got to be careful. So that was a great recommendation, Ryan, mm -hmm. the second opinion. And uh, uh, we, we really appreciate you taking your time to be on navigating cyber risk. Uh, and we are really excited about when this podcast gets released. So thank you so much for your time. Um, if you'd like to uh, learn more about, uh, about Ryan, um, we uh, are going to have some references and things in this podcast. So you can reach him at, uh, 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 you can reach him at uh, 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 what essentially is his LinkedIn account. Um, or his company website, myitindy.com. And uh, um, so we have to ask you as well, um, I'd like to close with one more question, uh, kind of more of a personal question that I think everyone needs to consider in their lives. Um, if you could go back in time and give your younger you advice, what would you tell yourself? What would that be? So back when I was in middle school, I uh, actually early high school, I think it was. Um, I had worked during the summer and I had earned, I don't know, like $1,500 or something like that. And my parents came to me and said, Ryan, we, you have a choice. We can give you this money in cash or you can uh, invest it. And uh, I did what every, you know, 13 or 14 year old uh, did back then. I bought a Nintendo. The other option at that time was buying Apple stock. So back in the late 80s, early 90s, um, I could have probably bought my current house with what that stock would have been worth. Um, so the, what I'd have to tell my younger self is to don't buy dumb things and invest your money because as I get older and older, um, having money to do vacations and stuff is a lot more important than having that Nintendo back when you're a teenager and you literally don't know anything. Um, uh, that's, that's great. The, the the Nintendo was probably a pretty good purchase because I got to tell you, I spent hours and hours and hours in front of mine. <laughs> it was great at the time, but, you know, they die and they don't work anymore. Then you're like, oh, man, I wish I had that fifteen hundred dollars back because that would have I mean, Apple stock was like eight or nine dollars a share back then with like 14 splits ago. So it would have been scary. <laughs> well, hey, Ryan, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again so much. Um, and to our audience, for those that are listening, if you did learn something today, or if you maybe you laughed or smiled, or you know, please tell somebody about our podcast. Um, you know, we are covering topics that are generally technical that we're trying to make sure that are non-technical as much as possible. And so, um, so again, thank you, Ryan, um, and thanks to the audience. It's been a fantastic episode of Navigating Cyber Risk with your hosts, John and George. Thank you so much, everybody. Ryan, we do hope that your peppers and your salsa turn out <laughs> wonderful. I'll and, send you guys pictures. <laughs> okay. Well, we actually have a friend up in Indiana, so we might come by. So There you go. Come on by, because the FDA does not allow me to send it out of state. So, yeah, come on by. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. This was another amazing episode of Navigating Cyber Risk, powered by Omnistruct. Show us some love by subscribing and sharing today. Reach out to us with any comments, questions, or ideas about future shows by emailing us at podcast at Until next time, remember governance is not a technology. 